discussion. Uh, as you know, the Institute Lecture is really a, a very uh, important and traditional event in the uh, AICHE history. And it is uh, really a pleasure for me to introduce uh, this year's Institute Lecture, uh, particularly since uh, he is, was a colleague at Purdue for some 25 years. And, more or less grew up together in, in academia, um, and he certainly uh, uh, has uh, exceeded me by leaps and bounds. So it's fitting that I introduce him to the media uh, But Nicholas uh, Pepys, uh, whom you all know, is a uh, chair professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and he holds chairs in chemical engineering and biomedical engineering in the College of Pharmacy. He is really a world leader in the field of biomaterials and drug delivery has been enormously productive with uh, some 31 books that he has edited or co-edited or authored, over a thousand publications and on the order of 35 patents. Um, and of course, as a result of this work, he is really among the world's most highly cited authors in this domain. Um, in addition to uh, uh, his productivity, um, he has also been recognized uh, in a number of communities as over a hundred awards and I would take up the entire period to recite them. I will focus on the principal ones, which are membership in the National Academy of Engineering, uh, also the election to the French Academy of Pharmacy, which is an unusual step for a chemical engineer. Um, he is also, of course, within the AICHE context, a fellow of the AICHE. He has received two division awards, uh, both from the, uh, the uh, Food, Pharmaceutical, and Bioengineering Division, as well as the Materials Division. Uh, he has uh, uh, been the uh, William uh, Walker awardee uh, relatively recently, as well as awardee of the, the James Bailey Award of uh, the relatively newly created uh, uh, society within the Institute. I think one of the key characteristics of Nicholas, however, has been his mentorship of, of students and postdocs. And he has uh, completed well over 70 PhD students, and nearly half of them have taken academic Issues. So clearly he has had a major influence through his academic tree, and I think it's particularly noticeable the energy and effort that he uh, invests in promoting their careers and in mentoring and advising them. And I think in that he's really a model for all of us. So I, I think you will enjoy very much uh, this year's Institute Lecture, and without further ado, I would like to invite Nicholas to proceed. selected as the 59th recipient of the Institute Lecture. This is really a great honor I could ever imagine. The first lecture was given in 1949, in November 1949, by Professor William McAdams of MIT, a towering figure of chemical engineering, as you will see in a few minutes. The second one by Professor Ola Taupian of the University of Wisconsin, whose uh, teachings have been really in uh, my life all, all the time since I have worked in addition to diffusion of all kinetics and reaction engineering. I know that I have confused a lot by the title of my talk. What is the first few words? Le plus en change. Well, it's a saying in the French uh, language that has become quite well known to literary people. And it was first introduced by a very well known editor of Le Figaro uh, in Paris in 1849 by Alphonse Carr, and it says, the plus change, the plus change shows. The more it changes, the more it remains the same. And now, connecting that to my title of my talk in English, you can understand my message. We are coming here today to be proud as chemical engineers that we have contributed to the areas of biotechnology and the area of nanotechnology, which are an integral part of the field, and as I will show you in a few minutes, they are still chemical engineering. I was asked by Rex if I could announce uh, this recognition, if I could connect things a little bit with the centennial that's coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, on June 12, 2008, ASHC will celebrate 100 years. On the eve of the 100th birthday of ASHC, I would like to reflect upon the origin of chemical engineering and the future of our field. 
Most of you in the audience know the picture of this man, you know this man, George E. Davis, University of Manchester, 1887. He was the one who prepared a series of 12 lectures on chemical engineering and taught them last year. One year later, Louis Sorkin at MIT in the chemistry department started the industrial chemistry emphasis and he was the first one who introduced similar lectures at MIT in a course that he taught chemical engineering. But it was William Walker, William H. Walker, who was hired by MIT in 1902 as a lecturer who really became the father figure of chemical engineering in the United States as we know it now. And I want to pay special attention to the fact that these two gentlemen were in the 30s when they did what they did for chemical engineering. George Davis was just 33, Louis Norton was 33, he died unfortunately very young, and William Walker was 33 when he became a professor at MIT. He was 39 when he started the SCAG. And I give that as an example to the younger generation of this audience. Please, we want your ideas. We want your enthusiasm. <coughs> Without it, we will be stale. I'm writing an article for the Chemical Heritage Foundation as a commission article for 2008 on the occasion of the ASCAG. And I had to go back a lot to original documents. In the annual report to the president of MIT in 1902, you see the first announcement of the appointment of William H. Walker and the fact that his appearance there was strengthening the laboratory of industrial chemistry. Notice how the laboratories were at that period. People were well dressed, still with coats, very properly next to each other doing their experiments. In 1905, this is, these are the graduates of course 10. Now, those of you who haven't been to MIT, you don't understand what this is. The word course in MIT parlance means department, means discipline. So, course 10 has been for more than 110 years a chemical engineering department. And you can see the ASC, the graduates of that year, and in the middle, a young man who became another towering figure of chemical engineering. Uh, Warren K. Lewis, otherwise known to all of us as Doug Lewis. He finished in 1905 chemical engineering. He went to the University of Breslau in Germany, where he studied organic chemistry. He came back in 1908. He joined MIT, and the rest is history. William Walker and Warren K. Lewis together, along with Professor McAdams, published in 1923 the first major fundamental book in chemical engineering in our field in the United States. This is the second edition, unfortunately, I don't have the first edition. This is the edition where Ed Gilliland, whom I met before he died in the 70s at MIT, uh, Ed Gilliland was the fourth author, and this is really the principles of chemical engineering. This was a wonderful period for chemical engineering, and especially to the young ones. As you think of that period, please don't think prehistory. In sciences, we were very advanced. This is from the 1908 report to MIT. Here is a picture of William Walker in his laboratory with his coat and tie and everything else. Uh, not very unusual for that period. I'd like to point out to the attention here from the report of the, of the chairman of the Department of Chemistry, Professor Talbot, to the president, how he was thanking indirectly Professor Walker for being very active in new chemical societies. It was that year that William H. Walker and five other men started ASCG. Notice how third that there were certain other assistants that were reported in 1908. Three of them I would like to mention briefly. Milton Winnaker and down here, uh, Dr. Hubbard and Dr. Howard. All three of them became later presidents of ASCG. William Walker was a graduate of Penn State University in 1891 in chemistry, and then he received his doctorate at the University of Göttingen in 1895 in chemistry. For me, this little tidbit is particularly important and emotional. My grandfather, maternal grandfather, Peter Bouchoklos, was working next to William Walker in the same laboratory, the laboratory of Otto Bala. Otto Bala, of course, received the Nobel Prize in 1910. So every time I talk about William Walker, I have a special feeling about what was happening in those times. What was happening in those times? There were several individuals that were helping in the development of this new field of chemical engineering. One of them was Richard Mead. Richard Mead had started a periodical that he was calling Chemical Engineering. Here's a picture of Richard Mead. And he was particularly interested in seeing that field growing. By about 1905, there were approximately 500 chemical engineers. 
and he succeeded in that. Indeed, on Friday, June 21st, 1907, at 5 p.m., 12 chemists and chemical engineers met at the Hotel Chonfon in uh, Atlantic City, and they had the first meeting about establishing a society, and that led to the Committee of Six that you see here. And I want to pay personal attention to Arthur D. Little, that many of you know, he was a little bit older than the other man. Dr. Mead, Dr. Makina, who became the first spry, the first secretary, and of course, William Walker in the middle, indicating to you who was really the lion behind the society. This is a cartoon style from Atlantic City, from my own personal collection of the Hotel Chalfon in 1905. A few years, a year later, on June 22nd, 1908, in Philadelphia, they met again. And this is the first meeting of ASCG. And I'm reading from the minutes, a meeting of the organization of the American Academy of Chemical Engineers was called to order at 11 a.m. on June 22nd, 1908, at the Engineers Club of Philadelphia on 1317 Spruce Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This was written by my friend. And it is interesting that he was calling it American Academy of Chemical Engineers. They corrected him in the minutes and they said, no, it's the American History of Chemical Engineers, not the American Academy. The enthusiasm was very high. The building still exists. In 1993, it was sold to a civic organization in Philadelphia, but it's still there. And I would highly suggest that perhaps next year's president and Johnson Franco arrive at 11 o'clock, at 11 10 a.m. on June 22nd and place an appropriate plaque for this particular building, recognizing our contributions. This was the first president of ASCG, Samuel Stedler. I want to remind you, Leo Bechelin was another president of ASCG, of Bechelin fame. And of course, Milton Whitaker, one of my favorite uh, chemical engineers of that period. From the inside of the book, to the book by Martin Corbett and Fourdinier, Sylvia Fourdinier, I met both of them, and I remember I had a lot of discussions with them in the early part of my career. I have here taken a copy of the members of ASCG. Ladies and gentlemen, look at this incredible thing. In the first 25 years, the number of members was 100, 200, 250. They started with 40 members out of 500 possible. It was in the 30s and 40s that we had an explosion in the members of chemical engineering. As you know, arrived in the late 90s to 55,000 members. The training of chemical engineers at that period was a massive debate. And Milton Whitaker, who in 1908 went to Columbia and became a professor of chemical engineering at Columbia, was very much uh, convinced that what had to be taught was chemistry, physics, mathematics, whatever we call fundamentals, and thorough analysis of the field, much combined with what he called the Natural Engineering Institute. It was a very interesting approach, and I can say that in the long run, we can do what want. But it was not without a lot of problems. In my personal archives, I have a letter from, actually, I have a copy of a letter. If I say I have a letter, I think Farmer would be very upset. A copy of a letter of Amy Davis of the Hilton Davis Company. So this was a company of pigments and dyes in Cincinnati. In fact, the company was independent until 1993, when it was bought by Salonese. And he was a letter he had written to Norris Shreve very famous professor of chemical engineering at Purdue on September 27, 1935. And let me read for you what he was saying. While I'm on this subject, may I suggest that each year you try to turn out a few good industrial chemists. I don't mean the so-called chemical engineers who have spent most of their, rock, their time on strains and stresses of steel and other products that they don't need. I mean men who know how to look at a formula and give it a name, who know the principal reactions for the replacement of groups in the organic molecule. We are greatly disturbed over the variety of guinea pig chemical engineers that call themselves engineers as well that we have to employ. And that was 1935. But as you go back and you look at the archives, there are some other fascinating points. <laughs> especially for somebody who has dedicated his last 35 years to our engineering. In the report to the president of MIT in 1894, guess what it is mentioned? That chemical engineers should have a fair knowledge of chemistry and biology. And now I'll bring another letter from my Purdue archives. I had the opportunity to meet 
Ernest H. Hartwig, who was the first master's student graduate in chemical engineering at Purdue. I met him at the age of 92. We had some correspondence. And this is from one of his letters that he wrote to me a little bit before he died in uh, 1989. Actually, he wrote in 1985. Now, don't, don't forget, Ernest Hartwig was born in 1895. He had a BS degree in 1919, so he works in the university during World War I. And he says, he talks about the curriculum, and he says, in the summer of 1917, they changed the curriculum, obviously, because we were in the middle of the war. The curriculum of the entire university was drastically changed, and our class missed the survey, and also one semester of biology, which I have always regretted. Ninety years ago, biology was being taught in Canada. Yeah, you guys, how many? Eight more years until we finally grow it back. <laughs> this too much is a historical introduction, but that historical introduction is very important to the message I'm bringing today. Louis Hebelius, who is one of the most recognized industrial chemical reaction engineers, a scholar, has contributed tremendously to chemical engineering, member of the National Academy of Engineering. When he looks at chemical engineering, and we have discussed the subject of times, he says, the last 70 years, what chemical engineering has been doing is he has been responding to societal needs. Look at what has been happening in the field. And I sat down and I looked at everything, and I know I have a lot of young people who don't remember that video or they don't have an interest in reading, reading what was happening before World War II. In the period of 1935 to 1950, our concern was the preparation for World War II, then we had World War II, then we had the aftermath immediately after. So what was happening in the field? Defense, new nuclear research, synthetic rubber production. How did chemical engineering respond to all these things? He responded by expressing unit processes, unit operations, chemical techniques. Fifties, the GIs came back, the Germans came back, the Japanese came back. What did they want? To relax. After 10, 12 years, the last thing they cared was to continue wars. We all got into a simpler life simpler uh, buildings, uh, houses, and so on, people got into petrochemical improved living standards. That led to the petrochemical industry, to the plastics phenomenon, and the corresponding changes in chemical engineering to respond to the societal needs were chemical reactor engineering, biology, and mechanics. In 1957, Sputnik came out. A little after that, light that was celebrated, like the first dog last week. And uh, Yuri Gagarin, a few years later, John Glenn. The United States became very concerned about that. That was also the beginning of the Cold War, 1963. We had the missile crisis in Cuba. Lunar program, communication satellites, that led to the explosion in controls in the very early forms of informatics with the very primitive computers that we had at that time, the communication system synthesis. 1968, immediately after the revolution in Paris with the students, and a little bit later, after the revolution in the United States, of the U.S. students, a new generation of, of, uh, of Americans came up that were demanding better concern for pollution, air quality control, and so on. And that led to environmental engineering. This continued in the 70s with the energy crisis. And of course, coal research became very important at that time. they phase steel reactor, chemical reactors, and so on. In the 80s, health problems became very important for the nation. And that led immediately to more work in biomaterials, drug delivery, biomedical problems, biochemical problems. Tissue engineering was started in 1986, believe it or not, by NSF with their first initiative. <coughs> then in the 90s, all of us got excited about our new computer units, and that led to the sensors, bioinformatics, and engineering, and then came now technology. But as Lewis Hagelis and I say, these waves have been cumulative, ladies and gentlemen. They are increasingly globalized, and they drive chemical engineering from the macroscopic to the microscopic to the nanoscale and to the molecular level. But they are cumulative, and many of us have forgotten that. And they think that our only goal in my life is to do nanotechnology and nothing else. So, why are we interested in bioengineering and nanotechnology? Is this a sign of uh, research funding greed? Some cynicists will say that, but it's not true. This is really the response of chemical engineering to societal needs. We need better products, we need better services, 
we need better energy and so on. We need to really respond that way. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, in May of 1967, I was finishing my freshman year uh, as a chemical engineer at the National Technical University of Athens. And at that time, you know that an artificial kidney did not exist except as an experimental device at Cleveland Clinic and here at the University of Utah, just three miles uh, east of here. Wilhelm Kolf had come from the Netherlands, first to Cleveland Clinic, Believe it or not, in January of 1967, here he is the originator of the artificial kidney. And Colt is 96 years old, he's a wonderful man, he's still alive. Uh, as you probably know, I'm president of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, uh, uh, American Biological Engineers. We had him in February in Washington. Uh, he was really a wonderful man, he's done so much with his profession. This is really one of his areas. Uh, don't forget the same man developed the official heart, and we are celebrating on December 2nd here in Salt Lake City, the 25th anniversary from the first heart implanted on Barney Club. So, the contact lenses did not exist in 1967. People were suffering from hypoxia from the heart contact lenses, and they had to take them out several times a day. Patients were dying from blockage of their arteries, and angioplasty was unknown. In fact, I remember I was supposed to in Clark Hawkins laboratory, and we were doing the first angioplasty, believe it or not, on New Zealand white rabbits. Respiratory distress syndrome was a disease from which many kids were dying, neonatals. Perhaps some of you remember JFK and Jackie had a third child who was born while JFK was an office, Patrick Kennedy. And he died three days later from this disease. And in fact, it was because of this disease that we got a lot of money for respiratory distress syndrome. In 2007, TPA and streptokinase have standard techniques of treating patients with thrombotic problems. My dear colleague, George Urgiu, in his baby lecture yesterday, talked about TPA, which is produced now by Genentech, and how many people it saves. In 2007, we have methods to prevent aneurysms, to strengthen arteries, to replace arteriosclerotic plaques. This is the set that many of you are familiar with, some of you may be even worried it. Julio Palmas, an Argentinian radiologist who came to the University of Texas Health Sciences in San Antonio in the middle 70s, and who had some experience in engineering, was the person who developed the power. Uh, we have that stand with a UD father, the US father that is here. Now, the treatment of rare diseases is possible through genetic engineering advances, and natural organs are being grown natural organs to replace arteries, even even in cases like the liver, which is an extremely difficult organ to replace. The contributions of chemical to the engineers to the field, to this field, have been tremendous. And you should be proud of your chemical engineers. And in fact, they have transcended science and they have become, how may I say, popular science at the same time. Some of our own chemical engineers have become equivalent to Hollywood uh, people. I show you here a picture of Linda Griffith, a very well known chemical engineer, winner of the MacArthur Award last year, the Genius Award, which only very exclusive to other people have already seen. She received it last year, and she's here with Alan Alda, talking about her artificial flavor. This became a series of PBS DVDs. But especially if you have young children, I highly recommend you buy them and show them to you. You will see the artificial alaolda with Linda pointing out the liver, the heart, and so on, and how they can be replaced. And this is Bob Langer of MIT and one of uh, the young colleagues from Texas, Texas, Mariah Han, who is an assistant professor at Texas a &M, with Julian Andrews. Now, what do they have except for Hashford? singing sound of music. Uh, what do they have in common? Julie Andrews had a problem with her vocal cords. She lost her voice in 1997. She really made every possible effort to come up with replacement of vocal cords. And Bob and Moriah in 2002 started working on cell based replacement of her own vocal cords. And it is people like this that we need to congratulate because they bring to our patients important solutions. So, ladies and gentlemen, chemical engineering has contributed tremendously to the treatment of sickness and disease. And I can say proudly right now that chemistry, biology, and engineering together have 
contributors, not only to genetic map of individuals and to uh, understand how diseases and genetic defects occur, but they have contributed also with new biomaterials, new drug delivery systems, with replacement of tissues, with non-invasive diagnosis. And this is going to be a recurring theme throughout my talk. We cannot just stay on today's treatment and be happy with it, have all the treatments and be happy with it. We need to improve the quality of life of our patients. Because bioengineers have a distinctly different calling than other engineers. What we do, we don't do it for the money. We don't do it for the publications. We don't do it for the patents. We do it because we work with patients and we really want to improve their lives. And I will have plenty of opportunities to discuss that today. Chemical engineers have contributed to bioengineering. There's several part of my talk, very short time. I want to really recognize some of the work of others because I think it has been pioneering. And I know I have a time of some younger ones. Some of them remember, some of them have forgotten, some of them know. This is Alpha from uh, the University of Washington. And Seattle. By the way, one of the very few members of all three academies, science, engineering, and medicine who was the very early project developed the artificial kidneys. And under him, Ben Hicks, who developed the very small miniaturized artificial kidneys, the of fiber kidneys of Galcoris, one of those Galcoris is now president of Fresenius. And I'm a big proud who really was the first one who taught doctors that you can take the basic principles of chemical engineering, mass transfer, and apply them to the artificial kidney. Basically, he developed the mass exchanges. And in fact, this is a book from the late 60s published by NIH on the evaluation of hemodialysis and dialysis membranes. And guess what? About half of the book is directly under the PhD thesis of Grant Horton and tells doctors how to calculate clearance and, uh, and so on. Three other chemical engineers, Ed Leonard, Mitchell Lind, and Ken Keller, were really early pioneers of the rational design and development of artificial organs. In fact, immediately after this session, and we are celebrating the 75th birthday of Adele Leonard and I should be summary the audience. Thank you all for the tremendous contributions to the field. This is the first book of Ken Keller published on fluid mechanics, mass transfer, and artificial organs in the late 60s. This one was not published by ACG. It was published by the American Society for Artificial Internal Organs, and I have a copy of it, and it was $10. It was a chemical engineer and chemist in 19. Professor Otto Richterle in Prague, who developed the first soft contact lenses that in the 60s, late 60s, became the Bausch and Long soft contact lenses. And it was another chemical engineer, Professor Alan Michael, Michaels, who left MIT around 1970, went to Stanford, and went also to Alza Corporation that had been started by Alejandro Zamparoni, and along with two other chemical engineers, who marched under Sikara, the speaker of Chad King, and uh, Pat Wong. They developed the first truly successful drug delivery system for ocular treatment of glaucoma. It was released in pilocardi for a whole day. This is how it was placed under the eye for a whole day. And patients that were suffering from glaucoma were really could really see and not feel the pain. Ed Merrick has been a towering uh, figure in the field of biomedical engineering. He's completed this year 60 years of continuous research. He's the father of biomaterial science. He's the originator of the polyethylene glycol and polyethylene oxide materials that many of you youngsters in the audience are using in all your papers. And he has been the progenitor of seven generations of chemical engineers and chemists. His academic thing has 1,075 chemical engineers. You know, as I was preparing this talk, I was becoming extremely sentimental and emotional in several months. I hope I will not say any of this emotion today. Uh, but one thing that I want to point out is everything in our field depends on one little event. Ed Merrill was a senior in chemistry and Greek literature. He speaks perfect ancient Greek, unfortunately with an Erasmian pronunciation, but that's, <laughs> that's something else. Uh, and so, and guess what? He arrived late one day and he went to the wrong class. And Professor McAdams from MIT was visiting Harvard that day. He was talking about chemical engineering. He didn't leave. He sat down. He listened. Guess what? He went to McAdams after that and he said, when I finish my bachelor's degree, I would like to transfer to MIT to do my PhD there. And he 
and in 1945, he started his PhD at MIT. If McAdams were not giving that lecture that day, there wouldn't be Bob Langer right now. There wouldn't be Clark Carlton, Alan Hoffman. Your speaker would not be here. I'm pretty sure the field would be still where it is, or perhaps a little bit different. But one little thing. So think of old George, George Bailey. It's a wonderful life. And you can see what one little thing can do to a particular person's life. Um, so please do me a favor. When you teach classes or you give a lecture, and a poor kid comes in five minutes late and opens the door and is lost, don't say, get out of here, you're not in my class. Please bring him in, bring her in. Sit down, welcome them, tell them a little bit about what you're doing. You may have a new admiral or a Bob Langer to continue the science. The followers of Ed Merrill have been many and distinguished. Alan Hoffman on the left, Buddy Ragnar, both members of the National Academy, chemical engineers by training or became chemical engineers as they studied the chemical engineering department. My, uh, Stu Cooper, Ohio State University now, Mike Zeppelin in Canada member of the Royal Academy. Uh, David Turrell at Caltech, who was an undergraduate working in the laboratory, helping Mike Seffer and me at the Maris Laboratory as a chemist. But now he's, as you know, the director of chemical engineering at Caltech. Wonderful work on using genetic engineering to produce a new generation of biomaterials. And Angel Powell, originally from Texas, Caltech, Zurich, and now at the Apollo Technique Federal in uh, Los Angeles who is probably the most imaginative designer of medical systems right now, with, with, with wonderful facilities. The first two, both members of the National Academy, are the writers, the authors of the book Biomaterial Science, which is really the Bible in the field right now. Where he changed. He left CMU, Columbia, earlier. He went to Harvard and he started teaching, I mean, he was doing it even earlier, he started teaching doctors how to apply the fundamentals transfer for the detection of tumors. And he has become really one of the most decorated scientific engineers right now in the country. And of course, Larry McIntyre, who helped us understand cell response to adverse blood conditions. Our dean of chemical engineers in the biomedical field, Ed Lightfoot, has contributed only, not only to classical phenomena, you know, but also as, a, as an incredible, brilliant modeler of medical problems and especially the writer of what is the most successful text and monograph by medical engineering. No, it's not BSL. Transport phenomena and living systems, widely in 1974. In the area of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, the bishop dietary compartmental models are still used as the standard of analysis of what could happen to drugs in your body. They were developed by Ken Bishop that we lost last year very suddenly, and by Bob Bentley, and I'm happy to report is still very well with us at NIH. Wonderful every word in the field. Tissue engineering is a subject that is really driven mostly by chemical engineers. And I have decided to present just six of the absolutely wonderful chemical engineers who have changed our lives. Tony Nicholas, our winner uh, this week of the Alpha Sigma Award. Linda Griffith, who is the MacArthur Award recipient last year. Kato Lorenz, uh, an absolutely wonderful man, head of orthopedic surgery at Virginia, and also professor of chemical engineering, member of the Institute of Medicine, who has been able to really create some absolutely wonderful new organs, including reproduction of nerves in, in mice. Rea Bisius, who is the, excuse me, Rea, the grand dame of uh, bioengineering, spent all her life at RPI, and she's now at the University of Texas, San Antonio, Really a major figure in tissue engineering in this environment, yes, interactions. David Mooney was at Michigan, not Harvard, and Matt Macy Arbush. All of these people have really created a new generation of tissue. And I think Rob Davis said it very nicely in his award, Awards for Sunday, how really tissue engineering has helped our field. Drug delivery, another major area, which basically is nothing else than the application of mass transfer to try to come up with a profile of diffusion that is more controlled, more constant, rather than the profile that you would get from the present application of tablets and capsules that you take every day. Yoshi Post and Ben Bouillon, leader in transdermal systems, David Edwards at Harvard, the first really leading authority in pulmonary delivery, 
both of them members of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, Lisa Brown from Biotechnology, Anna University of Texas, the first scientist that went to was in my job, developed the first diabetic chemotherapeutic drug in our delivery systems. And Mark Salzman, who has become a grand man now again in biomedical engineering, but whose roots are in chemical engineering. But this is not only in biochem biomedical, also in biochemical. Giorgio Gio, in his wonderful lecture yesterday, talked about Elmer Gaiden of Colombia, who in the 40s became really the pioneer and father of biochemical engineering. And then Art Humphrey and Daniel Wong. And of course, Mike Schuller and Jerry Schultz and Harvey Blanche, who not only have become leaders in the field, but at the same time have produced a whole new generation of outstanding academic and industrial uh, leaders. And then Glenn Fredrickson of Minnesota and Ramir of Krishna at uh, Purdue, who had had a profound effect on our, on our understanding on cellular modeling, especially with the population balances. This is the work of Ramir on population balances. Greg Stephanopoulos of MIT recognized that something the founders of work, and of course Rob Davis very nicely mentioned at that time, he has written the standard in the field of metabolic engineering. This is the book. And Ted Kopchak is who, by the way, at the National Technical University in Athens was his junior by a long year. Terry Kopchak is at Rice, uh, uh, Northwestern, and now at Delaware, a major figure again by chemical engineering. It is impossible for me to present everybody. I would like to recognize everybody. I would like to tell you about the wonderful research that will not leave any time for mine. But let me say, Jay Kisling, who got the Professional Progress Award this week, and Chaitan Kosla at Stanford, and Bernard Olson, who is now in the biomedical department and spent a significant period of his time at Michigan Chemical Engineering. And I hope it's been really an incredible author of books in teaching engineering, and especially in systems biology, where he's one of the leading authorities. And of course, uh, Christiansen. I have selected these young individuals, and especially Chaitan and Christy, because Chaitan and Christy were the first two chemical engineers to be elected to the Harvard Huge Medical Institute. Unfortunately, Chaitan, because of the technicality, could not accept. And so Christy is now the only chemical engineer, I believe, who is a Howard uh, huge medical fellow. A really major recognition. It means that chemical engineers speak to biologists and medical doctors. And I want to stress what Greg Stephanopoulos said so very nicely on Monday. We are not second rate biologists anymore. We are chemical engineers that can compete and can understand biology. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been now six years since Jay Bailey passed. And uh, um, we still miss him. Uh, he really came into the field of reaction engineering. He developed biochemical engineering as we know it now. His book with David Ollis, this book, Biochemical Engineering Fundamentals, has been really the standard book in the field for 30 years. But there's a generation after him. And that generation includes both Francis Harvard and George Giorgio. Francis has done wonderful work on direct evolution, and George Giorgio on protein structures. You heard about it on Monday when he gave his baby lecture. And this is really what chemical engineering is offering to the world. Doug Laufenberger has been a true pioneer in the field. Doug came into the field and he used his mathematical model and ideas from Minnesota that he learned so well from Ken Keller, that you remember about 10 slides earlier. And he started working in the field. He was the first one who came up with modeling of ligand receptor interactions. This book was published about 24 years ago, Receptors, with Jennifer Lieberman at Michigan, who was his PhD student, has become a classic. Bob Langer and I came from MIT. In fact, a little tidbit that most of you don't know is we are born exactly the same month, same year, almost same day. And uh, we knew each other. In 1976, we met at the Delhi Boylston Street, and we promised each other we were going to get to the biomedical field. It was very difficult. In those days, we had pubs in SH in Germany, we had pubs in Kennedy Science, and so on. And we were publishing, but at the same time, we were trying to write things. Of course, uh, we developed the first uh, pharmaceutical delivery systems in 1977, and then biomaterials based devices in the 80s. But especially Bob is really much, much, so much better than anybody else. He has done so much great work. 
new biomaterials, drug delivery, tissue engineering, stem cells, chemotherapy, you name it. He's now excited about cancer nanotechnology. That's his latest thing. As you know, he just received the National Medal of uh, Science. He's a member of both the academies. And I wonder, ladies and gentlemen, as I close the second part of my talk, I have three bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many patients have been cured and saved because of what Bob and I are doing. What all these chemical engineers have done. And what a huge impact to the field has been in the last few years. Chemical engineering now has incorporated all bioengineering aspects. And for example, the old biochemical engineering aspects can be found in biomethanalysis, metabolic engineering, bioprocess engineering. The old uh, biomedical or engineering medicine in biomaterials, drug delivery, tissue engineering, and artificial organs. And then there is one area in between that is, a, is an overlapping in the area, which is systems, computation, and synthetic biology. So coming back to the comments of Louis Hegedus, we are buying now health and nanotechnology, and we see an explosion in the field of nanotechnology that is especially prominent in the medical science. Why do we all care about nanotechnology, especially in the medical field? Because small size will lead to portable devices. I keep telling my undergraduates, 40 years ago you had to go to a hospital to be dialyzed. You had to lie on a bed, you had to be connected to this huge device with 300 liters, maybe 300 gallons, I don't remember anymore, of dialysis, and you had to stay there for four hours. Not anymore. In most cases, you can work with a portable kidney and you can continue functioning as a regular human, except that you're being dialyzed. Small sample volume, less waste, at the same time, hopefully, reduction of process times. The origin of many of these micro and nano devices comes from integrated air circuits. It took about 15 years for bioengineers to incorporate it. And I'd like at this point to make a small parenthesis and say, contrary to popular belief, ASCHE has been in the forefront of those areas. These are three publications from 1997, from 2002, and from last year on nanotechnology in the biomedical field. I happen to be in all three that I have edited, but that's irrelevant. What is relevant is that ASCHE has supported that area since the early days. And I ask you to seriously consider, you can't remember, the Society of Biological Engineers, it would cost you only $10. And what you're going to get in response, even if you work in oil and gas, you're going to be getting the latest news once a month coming directly to your email about what's happening in the medical world. As my good friend and colleague, Richard, Rebecca Richard Gordon says, every citizen should be also a little bit of a bioengineer. And I want to thank especially June Whisperway, chemical engineering by training. Uh, five years now has been in charge of the Society of Biological Engineers, which is also in charge of nanotechnology, as she has been doing it one minute. Returning now to these MEMS, microelectromechanical devices, that is really arranging the attention of a lot of the world, many individuals, including me, we are trying to find sensing elements that will recognize high concentrations of undesirable compounds in your body and they will be able to transmit that information through a transducing element in order for us to use it optically, electrochemically, or by mass sensitivity to really have an action on that particular system. In fact, Zach Hill, who is here in the audience, former PhD student of mine, now a professor at the University of Kentucky, we published a few months just the first book on nanotechnology and therapeutics. And what we can do, what many of us can do in the field, is come up with new sensors that are based on micro cantilever beams, not more than about 40 or 50 microns. We can place a very sensitive recognitive system, such as, for example, a hydrogel, and in the presence of pH changes or temperature changes, that hydrogen will start bending, actually then performing a particular action. Indeed, for example, with that field, we developed a whole series of pH sensitive hydrogels that are based on polymethacrylic acid and polyethylene light bulb. And this material is about the PKA, they expand and they have the ability then to start recognizing minute changes in pH. What one can do in these systems is one can take regular and well known lithographic techniques. One can take, for example, a microcontiliver beam or a microchip placed in silicon, 
and with an organocyte label such as treatment, one can deposit on it and adhere to it a liquid that is a combination of various liquids, cross linking agents, and so on, various components. And then one can place a mask on top of it and start reacting with the green light. When one removes the mask, one has now a micro pattern structure that can be used for a variety of applications to detect pH, temperature, and to act as an actuator. And here I show you one example from uh, where it was at, where you can see one of these micro cantilevers as it, I'll say it's on the left side, has a recognized pH. How well can they recognize the pH in this particular case? Look at the deflection in microns as a function of pH, and please concentrate on the, uh, what I would call the physiological conditions, the pH of about 6 to 7. And there the sensitivity, ladies and gentlemen, is down to the order of 1 nanometer is equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 5 units of pH. This is an incredible ultrasensor. Why would you need ultrasensors like this? For the simple reason that there are certain events in our bodies, as example, for example, thrombosis, that are associated with changes in the pH. And one can imagine that someday we can have such sensors to be able to recognize that the beginning of thrombosis takes place and send the information to some station. The same idea can be applied in our analytes. Not only pH and temperature. We can embed upon a polymer a particular structure that will recognize one to one specific analyte. And hopefully we can do that with selectivity and specificity. Let's take an example of a template, an analyte, a biomarker. What could that be? You know many people that suffer from diabetes type 1. High concentration of glucose. The template could be glucose. You have people that have hypertension, high concentration of angiotensin too. The template can be angiotensin too. So what we do is we have developed a technique that we call configurational biomedical printing. The technique has been developed exactly by Mark Berg, who is a professor at Howard University, and, and by, by us. And look what happens. We <coughs> select certain types of monomers that have specific interactions with that template. Those interactions are kind of bonding with the other types. Then we add particular solvents and initiators, and we do a very fast polymerization reaction, usually a UV polymerization, creating this engulfed structure. I don't want to use the word microencapsulation. This is not microencapsulation. It's really a continuous medium with these structures in it. Then we do an extraction and drying, and we are left with nanovacuoles that hopefully remember the template that we added to them. So it's a very, very primitive way of artificial intelligence, although I have to be careful, I can take a supermarket and kill me if I use that word in this application. We are making artificial locks from molecular keys. We want to find a lock that will be open only in one particular key. Do you remember the title of my talk? The visual shows or the visual amount shows. The more it changes, the more it's the same thing. In 1904, Evan Fisher propose this idea. Hundred years later, we have a possible solution for it. The field changes. I would like to say to the young ones, please go back to the old literature. Old is not only 20 years old. Believe me, there's a 25-year cycle. And if you go 30 years ago, you may see that the subject you're working on right now was being studied at that time. Mark Berg has done some wonderful work where he has now fluorescently labeled the glucose so that we can see that the cognitive systems can really see the glucose in the normal cavity you cannot see. And here you see some of the results. You see polyacrylamide, polyacrylamide, and in fact the particles, here are the cognitive ones, there is the normal cognitive. And we are able to come up with very high specificity and very high selectivity for these systems. With another former PhD student, David Hanford, who is a professor now at the University of Missouri at Roma, we have developed computational levels to study now how exactly this binding takes place. And I'd like to show you one little example from the simulations, which was just published in IEC this month. And you can see more information there about how we did the computation. And you can see now a structure that has found glucose on it. You can actually identify the specific sites where that binding takes place.
These are not the only molecules we are working with. Cholesterol is a very important material for us. And angiotensin too, for cardiovascular applications. Can you imagine if we can tell patients in advance that be careful, the event is coming? Gianfranco Spizzieri, who is now professor at the University of Calabria in chemistry, in a Caracalla Grande, he is the one who developed this absolutely wonderful system we published a few years ago in chemistry materials. A system, the first system that recognizes cholesterol, almost 1,500% more than the control. It's an extremely difficult system to make, but they are another major success. And now, what can you do with these cholesterol systems? We can, you can put them on microchips, you can put them on cantilever beams, and create now atom structures that hopefully can recognize just cholesterol, as you see here from some of the recent work of my design. So what we are doing is we are telling the intelligent polymers that we have taught them how to recognize, and then what we do is we incorporate and integrate with the sensing device, create basically the new generation of a plug of the therapeutic devices. And ASCG has already featured some of that work. This is the December 83, uh, 2003 cover page of uh, the ASCG journal, and this is from Nature Materials uh, with the country different themes. So how are the systems going to be used? First thing I want to say, especially because I have people from the FDA, my good friend Vince Bilger is from the FDA here today. I don't want him to attack me. This is 50 years from now, now Vince. It's not a bar warning. I'm not applying for, for an FDA yet. It will be an intelligent system. And this intelligent system would be a microchip that would be subcutaneously under your body and hopefully can last for quite a few months. And that would have arrays one of which can recognize glucose, another which can recognize it too, another can recognize a triglyceride and another triglyceride. And when you have a very good dinner and things go up, as they usually don't do after a good dinner, immediately that would be able to be captured by the imprinting technology. They would be able to immediately release a small amount of the drug. And at the same time, they would send the information to the city wafer under it, and from the signal wafer it would go to a wristwatch, and from a wristwatch to a station in the middle of your room, or perhaps to the doctor's office. And the next morning, the nurse would call Nicholas and say, Nicholas, last night you drank too much wine, and you had too much ice cream, you probably used to write some 300, you better come to the office immediately. And you know, we are all smiling because I'm trying to oversimplify the technique there are. Certain parts of these devices can be developed now in the University of Texas. Uh, we know most of the parts of how they work. We are still missing a very important part that has to do with the communication down here. But it's really the next level of intelligent delivery of systems. The same things can be applied to self microparticles. And in fact, for those of you who are interested, we have a volume we just published called Intelligent Verdict, published three years ago. Intelligent Therapeutics, Biomedic Systems and Now Technology and Drug Delivery. And then a wonderful volume with Mike Zeppelin on molecular and cellular combinations of biomaterials, where you can find a lot of this information. I have a wonderful colleague at the University of Texas Health Sciences at Houston. His name is Mike Smolensky, and he is probably the world's leader in chronobiology. And Mike has taught me, or has reminded me again something that I've forgotten, that all of us have a circadian rhythm and that certain components in our body are at higher concentrations at certain times of the day. Have you ever wondered why 75% of strokes are 7 to 9.30 in the morning? In fact, in my except it's true. Mike Smolensky was telling me recently, he says, I don't understand why people take their statins in the morning. They will work as a placebo. The statins have to be taken the previous night. So when you take your Lipitrol or your Cresco or whatever, take it at night, please, so that it is ready to act in the morning. At this point, usually the old time is subjected to what I'm saying. Oh, it's past this drop and drop, I'm saved for the day. We have a wonderful book that just appeared with Mike Smolensky on chronobiology, drug delivery, human therapy. It's just appeared. You can really look at how these things can be applied in the field. With Nikki Berger, who is now a professor at St. Louis, who is a biomedical engineer, we have been able to start recognizing proteins. This is the first time in our evolution of isozymes. And you notice what happens to the COVID-19 system. The chains kind of collapse 
giving a big opening so that now isozyme can be incorporated very nicely. Now, I have learned in my last 10 years, and I've come back to the days of MIT where they used to tell us, try to see also what products you can have. It's coming back very handy. I have learned to try to really translate those things a little bit into the industrial thing. If you go to a company and say, I develop this thing, and you don't give them an example of how it can be implemented, you don't gain very much. Um, we have been working recently on taking the systems and making them multi-layered, recognitive, micro-encapsulated systems, ladies and gentlemen. And look what happens to those systems. We have an external layer, a scheme as I call it, that recognizes now the undesirable. It breaks by osmosis or by stress or whatever. And then it allows the blue layer, which is really nanoparticles with the drug, to come out. Then there's a second layer recognizing, followed by a second layer of drug. And so what we are forming is this wonderful new systems that can be controlled based on the cross-linking, the polymer you use, and so on, to start exploding, as you can see here, at certain times and release it. This is an experiment, the first time I got into the laboratory in 20 years. This summer, I actually did this experiment, I'm proud of it, where I was able to show with a recognitive layer, the layers of the dye as it comes out because of the recognition process. This is a wonderful application of pulse dial drug delivery. You can go back 10, 15 years ago with this book to see really how we have modeled such systems before we even knew that they existed. We take it even one step further. I have a wonderful undergraduate. In my career, as Rick said, I had a lot of PhDs, not so many postdocs. I had about 150 graduate students, both in the PhD and master's, but about 500 undergraduates. And I really worked with them so well. And um, Barbara Eckert was only a freshman, I was in love with that. And uh, it's a wonderful new system uh, where you have maybe now a, a multi layer structure, a tablet, if you wish with the two external layers being recognitive, the next two being drug, the next two being recognitive, and look at the release profile. Here's the recognition process. It starts happening, the material starts cracking, starts releasing. This is the release part. Then here's the second recognition.